Welcome to my Days of Our Lives official channel. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. Before we begin, please hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. Abe receives a phenomenon from a heavenly caller in her bedroom, Holly entered a textbook from Tate asking her to call him. She didn't respond, which urged Tate to get her attention by climbing up to her bedroom window. Once she had let him outside, Tate hugged Holly and told her how important he'd missed her. When he pulled down, he commended how spooked he'd been and how he'd contemplated running down, but Holly told him he didn't need to leave. A relieved Tate verified with Holly that she was okay, and also he kissed her. An amused Holly called Tate Little Romeo after the kiss ended, and she compared him climbing up the kiosk to another boy she had known in sixth grade. When she mentioned that the boy had gotten a broken arm for his trouble, Tate noted he'd done crazier stuff. She didn't missed out his assertion but wondered what he was doing there. Tate said she had not responded to his dispatches, and since he did not have carrier suckers, he'd felt he was out of options. Holly explained that she did not know what to say to him and said she was sorry. Tate told Holly that she shouldn't be sorry, but Holly continued that she was shamed and embarrassed because she had taken the medicines indeed though he'd advised her against it. Tate asked if not hearkening to him was the only reason she was sorry, and Holly asked what differently she should have been sorry about. He filled her in on what had happened while she had been in the coma, including E.J. Condemning him for her overdose, having him arrested, and also transferring him to the recovery installation. Holly said she would had no idea, and Tate contended with her to help him by telling the verity and taking responsibility for the medicines. Holly refused, and an enraged Tate asked her why she was willing to ruin his life. Holly said she'd tell everyone Tate hadn't given her the medicines, but Tate pushed back that they would believe him shamefaced anyway. Holly explained how she had eavesdropped her mama say she'd be dissatisfied if Holly had taken medicines designedly and that her mama would condemn herself. Holly affirmed that she couldn't watch her mama fall piecemeal again. Tate asked if she'd immolate him to keep up appearances as the golden child, but a twist of the door handle intruded their argument. A slightly conscious Wendy and Tripp talked about getting wedded for real at a tabernacle on the sand. Wendy, head reclined on Tripp's shoulder, rumored that she loved their promises, but they had not gotten the chance to do them duly. She recited the traditional promises as she plotted to stay awake. They also imagined buying a house in the country and having two kitties. After they changed affirmations of love, a swimmy Tripp recited a prayer as Wendy appeared to lose knowledge. A tied-up Ava corrected herself for believing Clyde's falsehoods and plotted to get free. Steve and John arrived and were quick to rage at her for intruding up the plan. As they unfastened her, Ava told them that Goldman had claimed Trip was near death. She groaned how it was all her fault, but Steve cut her off and said he'd not accept that his son was gone. Back at the apartment, Steve and John claimed that they demanded to get the police involved. John called Rafe and told him about the hostage videotape. John agreed to shoot the videotape to the department through the computer and called the matter time-sensitive. The group decided to take another look at the videotape themselves for fresh suggestions. As they watched Trip read instructions in the videotape, Steve noticed that Wendy had been making gestures and indirect movements in the background. He honored the gestures as American subscribe language and discovered that Wendy had been subscribing the word beer. John noticed grooves in the walls on the videotape that led him to believe Tripp and Wendy were being held in a tank. Steve flashed back that a brewery was near the field, so the group rushed to the scene. They burst through the door and set up Tripp and Wendy unconscious. Steve and John performed CPR on the couple, and Ava called 911. John said he was losing Wendy as a frantic Ava said a prayer while Steve tried to revive Tripp. At the police station, Rafe and Jada expressed their continued shock that Goldman was the operative. Harris arrived and revealed that he'd checked himself out of the sanitarium against Croker. S. Orders. He wanted to help with the disquisition, so Rafe and Jada dropped their demurs and streamlined him on the disquisition status. Jada stated they had searched Goldman's apartment and poured her fiscal and phone records but had gotten no useful information. Harris mused that as a bobby. Goldman was no amateur, and they demanded to anticipate her moves by groaning where the elf's going, not where it's right now. Jada vented about assuring Goldman following the firing while the bobby had been drawing up for Clyde under their tips. 
Jada and Rafe began putting the pieces together that Goldman had presumably been behind the tried murder of Lucas. When Rafe got the call from John about Tripp's hostage videotape, the triad decided to track via GPS where Goldman's police sport fishermen had been traveling. They, too, figured out that Tripp and Wendy were likely being held at the brewery, so Harris and Rafe headed to the point. They drew their ordnance upon arriving only to find John and Steve performing CPR on Tripp and Wendy. Abe was soliciting at Paulina's bedside when a bright light enveloped the room and a woman appeared behind him. A shocked Paulina got Abe's attention, and when he turned, the woman said, Hello, Abraham, as she touched a marriage ring on her hand. A confused Abe asked if the woman knew him, and she responded, Of course. Abe wondered if he was hallucinating, but Paulina snappily responded in admiration, It's you, Lexi. Paulina introduced herself and said she had seen Filmland of Lexi. After asking Lexi if it was time, Paulina explained to Abe that Lexi was his first woman and that they had a son together. Abe flashed back reading about Lexi but had allowed. She was dead. Paulina verified Lexi had failed of brain cancer, so Abe asked Lexi if she was there to take Paulina to the other side. When Paulina told him that it was her time, Abe angrily stated that he'd not let Lexi take her. Lexi impelled Abe to flash back the last time she had seen him. Abe flashed back to meeting Lexi in heaven and telling her how important he'd missed her and that when Theo smiles, there you are. Abe surfaced from the memory and smiled at Lexi as he told her about how they had met and about their life together, saying he flashed back everything. He mused about his pull toward competent, contentious women and Lexi reminded him to concentrate on the woman to whom he'd made a commitment. Abe turned to Paulina and called her my everything. As Paulina faded, Abe reported the details of their marriage day and supplicated her, we've so important life left to live, my darling. Abe grew frantic when Paulina flatlined, and he appealed to Lexi to flash back how she had told him it was not his time and that his family demanded him when he'd been on the verge of death. Abe stressed that Paulina's family and musketeers demanded her, too, and he demanded her. Lexi revealed that she wasn't there to take Paulina but to help her. She told Abe to close his eyes, look deep into his heart, and transfer his love to Paulina. Believe, Lexi said. Abe repeated the word as he returned to Paulina and put his hand over her heart. The heart examiner proceeded its normal meter and an arriving nanny verified that Paulina was breathing. A crying Abe turned back to Lexi, but she was gone. As he watched Paulina in relief, he said vocally, I believe, I do. Abe Carver, a pillar of strength within the community, becomes the philanthropist of this heavenly phenomenon. Observers are drawn into the emotional trip of a character who, in the midst of life's challenges, encounters an unearthly force that defies rational understanding. Salem, a city where the line between reality and the mystical frequently blurs, becomes the stage for a disclosure that resonates with the universal themes of stopgap, faith, and the miraculous. As the heavenly caller graces Abe with a phenomenon, the shocking paragraph prompts reflection on the profound impact of godly intervention. Salem's residers, each scuffling with their own trials, are invited to witness a moment where the ordinary is touched by the extraordinary. The Elysian hassle becomes a testament to the cleaner piece's kidney's capability to explore the crossroad of the mortal and the godly, where the supernatural weaves seamlessly into the fabric of everyday life. The ripple effect of this heavenly phenomenon extends beyond Abe, touching the lives of those in his root. Salem, frequently a exemplification of mortal jests, becomes the oil where the characters navigate the emotional fate of a miraculous hassle. The shocking paragraph captures the substance of liar that transcends the confines of reality, inviting observers to suspend unbelief and embrace the possibility of the extraordinary within the ordinary. As the city of Salem bears substantiation to Abe's miraculous experience, the shocking paragraph serves as a lamp of stopgap in a narrative geography frequently fraught with challenges. The Elysian intervention becomes a symbol of adaptability and the enduring power of faith, leaving an unforgettable mark on the community and its residers. Salem, no foreigner to the unanticipated, stands at the crossroads of the mystical and the mundane, inviting observers to embark on a trip where cautions are woven into the veritably fabric of the city's narrative shade.